All right, so if you don't have any questions, I'll get started uh, on this chapter. This chapter is called the uh, electrocardiograph or electrocardiography. We'll be talking a little bit of history as to how uh, electrocardiography, electrocardiography came about. And it's very interesting, but uh, we have to give credit to uh, all those people that uh, have um, contributed to the, the profession of electrocardiography. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's still evolving but it has had a tremendous impact in, in the medical field. Physicians, doctors, they rely upon the evaluations of electrocardiography. We depend a lot on it because an electrocardiogram can tell us a lot about the person's condition. So if you remember the heart is, is your, your pump, right? It's the, uh, the organ that pumps blood around your body 24 seven, right? Every single second of your life. And if anything goes wrong with that little pump, then you're gonna be in big trouble. So knowing and understanding the, the heart is very important, uh, like I said, and um, because it affects all your body systems, right? If your heart isn't able to deliver blood to all of your body, then you're gonna have uh, uh, serious problems, right? Or complications, they could be chronic or they can be uh, acute complications. So the EKG and, and its history, where does it come from, right? Uh, I was reading yesterday, and I shared a document um, on the website about the the statistics that that are going on right now. There are so many people dying from from heart disease right now that it's 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 terrible. Even though there's been slight improvements, a slight decrease in the deaths of people uh, from from um, uh, what you call it from heart disease, uh, there's still you know one is one too many. Okay, so by um, <clears throat> by still having a lot of people dying left and right uh, from from this this problem, then you know, it, it's not good. So let me share with you a document that I got from the um, from heart.org, which is part of the American Heart Association, and they deal with um, with uh, uh, statistics. Okay, as far as uh, its deaths and so on. <clears throat> So, let me see here. This is kind of small, but this is online. I, I put it up on the, um, I put it up on the page. I mean, sorry, on the website, okay? And this, everything's kind of in the way here. There's too many people dying, okay? Heart disease. Uh, some of these terms sound very similar. And some of them are just um, completely different. But heart disease, cardiovascular disease, they all they sound kind of one and the same. And they are. Cardiovascular disease refers to two, it's a general term that we use to describe several conditions. Okay. So cardio refers to your heart, vascular refers to your veins and arteries. And those are one of the terms. We hear cardiovascular disease, it means diseases that are related to the cardio, to the heart, but also to your vessels. And we also talk about coronary artery disease. That's specific disease of the heart, okay? If you have, for example, uh, um, your arteries are getting clogged with a plaque, then you have coronary disease, the arteries that are in your heart, okay? If you have other problems like poor circulation, uh, low blood pressure, high blood pressure, and you have strokes and all, those are fall under cardiovascular disease. So. Cardiovascular is kind of like an umbrella term, okay, to describe several. Um, so again, the statistics are, are still quite um, quite frightening because anybody uh, is uh, can develop heart disease. Now, for you, those of you that are still young, uh, you should uh, learn to take good care of yourself, of your body. You are the steward of your body. If you don't take good care of it, then uh, do not expect to have a healthy and uh, and and you know a long life because it will catch up to you at some point, all right? If you're young right now, you probably think you can eat anything and do anything, and you probably can, but uh, in the long run, believe me, it will catch up to you. Uh, I've seen too many uh, people suffer from this condition and um, complications that can occur. So uh, yeah, I try my best to try to take care of myself and you know, just kind of stay within my, my normal weight. So between 2013 and 2016, 121.5 million American 
adults had some form of cardiovascular disease. So adults is anybody over 18. And uh, the statistics that I've seen, uh, believe it or not, uh, have gotten worse. If you, if you break that number down by age group, the younger people, there's many more younger people uh, developing heart disease, right? Uh, developing cardiovascular problems like high blood pressure. I've had students here as young as 17 and 18 years old with high blood pressure. And to me, that's very sad because, well, they're too young to be having those problems, all right? Either uh, because of stress or because of, you know, obesity or other conditions, they suffer these problems. And it's very sad to, to see young people uh, go through this uh, medical condition so early in their life. <clears throat> in 2013 and 2016, 50.57.1% of non-Hispanic uh, black females and 60.1% of non-Hispanic black males had some form of cardiovascular disease. So there's still a lot, you know, okay? There's still a lot of heart disease happening um, in the United States alone. And globally, it's also a problem around the world. It's a very severe problem. And uh, I'll ask a question right now. Uh, what, why do we have heart disease? Why do we have this problem? Can anybody tell me or have an idea why we have this problem? Uh, Janie, can you do you have an idea why we have so much heart disease? Mm, nothing comes to my mind right now, to be honest. Nothing goes through your mind. Well, do you understand what heart disease is? Like things that, um, like like you were explaining, the difficulties that you develop in the heart. Correct, right? Like uh, there's a term called atherosclerosis. I think we'll talk about it in the next chapter. When your arteries get um, narrow and less blood flow goes to your heart, right? These people start to develop heart disease. Uh, we, live, we live in different times, okay? But nonetheless, it uh, doesn't mean that, you know, it's impossible to live healthy uh, because of the high pace, you know, in, in our lives and stress and so many things that go through, through your life. Uh, you have you lose track of of, uh, of your well-being so people uh, gradually start to uh, either gain weight or or live uh, you know uh, have uncontrolled stress and so on and they start to develop high blood pressure and then they start to develop diabetes and diabetes as you know down here in the valley it's very very bad and diabetes is one of the major contributors of heart disease okay so we'll talk more about that later in the next chapter but Anyhow, you look at the numbers here and uh, you can read it uh, slowly. And um, I'm gonna throw in a, a, you know, a couple of questions from here, from this, from this uh, document uh, on the chapter one test uh, so that you can see uh, the numbers are just, you know, uh, it's never too late to make a change. So the sooner you start, uh, the better you'll be off uh, later in life. So, Again, that document is available on the website, on the portal, so that you can read it uh, and uh, look at it because it will be uh, putting in some questions on that. All right, so what about the history? How, how does somebody even have an idea of, right? Uh, someone had um, an idea that electricity was flowing out of her heart. It was like, you know, electricity, you can't see anything, but it's there, right? We are, uh, to some degree, electrical beings, our bodies, uh, produce electricity, okay? That's how we move, actually. Uh, one of the terms uh, that is in the chapter, I believe, or it's not actually one of the terms, but uh, if you know what electrolytes are, uh, electrolytes, you hear it, uh, well, it's in Gatorade, you know, it's on these sports drinks and so on. Electrolytes are elements that we, um, that we ingest every single day uh, through our uh, diet, okay? Whatever foods you eat, you're ingesting electrolytes. So they'd be milk, you have calcium, magnesium, you have um, potassium, sodium, which is salt. Then you have all these uh, in, um, elements that we're eating through our daily life. Now, why are these so important? Because electrolytes are um, those that are able to produce uh, or conduct an electrical charge, uh, such as copper con uh, conducts electricity. 
uh, we have a little bit trace element of copper in our bodies, but the main uh, electrolytes that are in our body are uh, calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, uh, and uh, I think that's those are the main ones that really these uh, elements are able to conduct an electrical um, signal or charge from the brain to your nerves, from the nerves to your muscles, so that we're able to move. All right. Now we're talking about electrocardiography here. Uh, what does that have to do with the heart? Well, the heart is a muscle too, and it requires electricity. Actually, it requires probably more electricity than most muscles because it works 24 seven. So as you know, can imagine it depletes a lot of your electrolytes. If you don't consume enough electrolytes, like just your regular you know, diet or nutrition, uh, you will get number one dehydrated. Your, um, your body will not have enough electrolytes to be able to function normally. You, of course, will feel tired and weak, but your heart will also feel the difference. Okay, your heart will uh, be lacking those nutrients that are very necessary for you to function normally, and you're going to start to feel very sick. All right. So, again, back to the uh, the bit of the history. So the EKG. Okay, and uh, some of the terms that are in here, like myocardial infarction and heart attacks are complications of cardiovascular disease. If you've had anybody that, um, that has, uh, has had a heart attack, uh, you might have known, you know, they, they had this chest pain, excruciating pain in the, in, the, right in the center of the chest, and then they fell, collapsed, and they call 911 and so on, right? So uh, if, in the document, okay, uh, that I just showed you, it has the number of, the number of, um, well, they call it um, heart attacks, or they call cardiac arrest. Uh, outside hospital cardiac arrest. Okay, that means that somebody had a cardiac arrest or the heart stopped while they were outside of the hospital. Either they were in their own home, they were in the public, or they were in the in the nursing home. Okay, so you have to know. Uh, I'm going to ask you to to look at that document and find out what um, what percentages of cardiac arrest happen in the home, okay? Can you, are you all able to help someone that has cardiac arrest? Norma, are you able to help somebody that has cardiac arrest? If so, how do you help them? Hello. All right. So, Jay, uh, Cynthia, can you help someone that has cardiac arrest? Are you able to help someone? And, and if you can, how do you help them? Norma, I think you should know the answer. Or Janie, you all should know the answer to this. If someone has a cardiac arrest... CPR, I don't know, Cynthia says. Well, Cynthia, you are correct. That is the way you can help someone by providing CPR. And here, uh, I think we already did CPR. Is that correct, um, uh, Norman and, and uh, Janie? I think y'all have gone through the CPR class. And if you don't remember that- uh, Yes, we have. Yes, you have, okay, yeah. So that is what we talked about. Remember, one of the main things that you as a healthcare provider have to remember is how to recognize cardiac arrest, okay? And we go through that in the CPR class. So um, you all learn, uh, learn later on, Ms. Cynthia, how to, um, how to uh, provide CPR. Now we, we uh, cover here the, um, the basic life support uh, through the American Heart Association. I know that Red Cross uh, and some other institutions also have uh, CPR, but uh, we use the one or healthcare in general we use the one through the American Heart Association, okay? And uh, the guidelines, and that's that's what we're gonna cover later on whenever we have a CPR class, Ms. Cynthia. So moving on. So um, people have heart attacks in the home, okay? And the electrocardiograph uh, came about a while back, okay? There was a couple of people that made major contributions to, the, to them. Number one first was Dr. Uh, Augustus Walter, uh, Waller. Uh, he was the one that actually uh, recognized or detected electricity 
coming out of the the body, right? He said, you know, he thought, well, how we can actually detect it, right? Uh, and to some degree, he um, he was able to show electrical currents that were flowing out of the body. Uh, if you can imagine this person, you know, back, uh, you know, 120 years ago, uh, he was doing this, you know, these things uh, with, I, I'm assuming they're wires or whatever he did to detect these um, electrical currents. I'm pretty sure the people at his time were thinking, well, this guy is crazy. He's, uh, he's doing witchcraft or some, you know, ma magic or something like that, right? People were probably freaking out at this man trying to uh, detect these electrical currents, you know? Uh, and then later on, um, Wilhelm Eindhoven was the one that actually designed um, the electrocardiograph, the machine that actually puts these all electrical currents in, a, in an organized manner that we can now interpret. And you will learn to interpret, uh, hopefully by the end of the course, you'll be able to interpret at least the most common um, arrhythmias that we see uh, in, in the medical field, okay? There's um, about, I think I wanna say maybe like about 15 of them. It's not that many. Now there is a lot more of them, but we're gonna cover the most common ones. So again, uh, in 1924, this one is uh, the machine was like actually developed and this machine has actually, you know, come long, long ways. Uh, you might, um, you might've seen commercials out there where they're showing this uh, little machine, this device that uh, you connect to your phone and you put, I think, is it two fingers or a thumb or something like that, or two, two fingers like that and a little pad. And it shows you, uh, they call it a medical, medical grade electrocardiogram. Okay. Now that's all very nice. However, what do you do? I mean, when you see the electrocardiogram, what are you supposed to do with that? You know, to me, sometimes too much information uh, can be given to the public where they don't really understand. They might misinterpret the information. They might um, panic, uh, you know, or, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a little bit too much. Now there's um, situations where some people can benefit from it, but those are very, very few, very few. So in general, um, electrocardiograms are not really necessary you know is doesn't help you as a as a as a late person to to track your heart okay it there's no point to it okay i think it's better to be able to track your 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 body listen to your body you know what it's telling you that to me is much more important if you feel good overall in general then you know you're fine but if you start to feel a difference in your body and it changes, then by all means, you should probably seek medical care, you know, get a checkup once in a while. 40 year old persons uh, or higher should be should have a, an electrocardiogram at least once a year. Now, how many people actually do that? Probably very few, very, very few people actually go to the doctor and have, uh, can I have my electrocardiogram, you know, my annual exam or whatever. Uh, very people, uh, few people do it. And that's why we we were not able to catch a lot of these uh, cardiac arrest. Okay, so I have one question. Uh, what is the leading cause of death in the United States? Type your answer. What is the leading cause of death in the United States? Go ahead and type your answer here in the, in the chat. CBD, CBD, right? It's a, uh, thank goodness for abbreviations. Um, cardiovascular disease. Again, remember, cardiovascular disease refers to not only the heart, but to other diseases that develop over time, okay, including your arteries and your veins, because there's veins also have problems. Who's credited with determining that the human heart produces electrical currents? Who's the person that detected the electrical currents around the heart? Who was that person? What's his name? Willem? Willem Eindhoven? Mm, nope. That was the guy that actually um, invented the, uh, the electrocardiograph. Oops, yeah. Uh, it is Mr. Doctor, we call him Doctor, right? Dr. Augustus Waller, there you go. Yes, Waller. He's the one that actually detected the currents, okay? So everything has a beginning, right? And this is the person that detected those electrical currents going around here. Um, you know, we're electric, right? Because uh, if you ever had electrical, um, uh, static electricity, okay? You can discharge electricity by touching some objects. Sometimes, you know, when you get off your car, you, you know, you touch the door and you get, you know, shocked. 
it's pretty interesting. So, all right, so how do we use an EKG? We can use an EKG in many, many places, right? But a healthcare provider, so your doctor, your nurse practitioner, physician assistant, you know, all kinds of doctors use um, EKGs, uh, most, mostly your family doctor. If you're 40 plus or older, they're gonna wanna have an EKG on you just as a baseline, okay? A baseline is, uh, you know, your base information like, okay, so, you know, where, where are you right now? Is your heart completely fine? All right, now, remember this, when a, a someone does uh, performs an electrocardiogram on someone, uh, it doesn't mean that you were fine yesterday. It only gives a picture of how you're doing right now. At that particular moment, the, the um, that your heart is, you know, uh, the, that the exam has been done. So it's a snapshot. It's a snapshot of your heart, okay? You can leave home and the next day have a heart attack. You know, was it? What happened? Well, because your EKG just shows what your heart is doing at that very particular moment, okay? Uh, if for some reason the next day you develop something you know, severe, all right, that's completely different. The EKG does not tell you anything about your arteries. That's another test, okay? So remember that uh, sometimes people will freak out because you go to the doctor and, and then later, you know, something happens. You know, well, I just went to the doctor a few months ago and I was fine. Okay, the EKG, again, it's only a snapshot. It's not something that, you know, it's continuous. That's, you know, that tells you how you're gonna be doing, you know, it doesn't tell you feature of your heart at all. So uh, again, healthcare providers, Use this for many, many reasons. We use it at baseline. Uh, if you're going to have surgery, if you're going to have a procedure done and you're, you know, uh, you have a high risk of uh, heart disease or you already have high blood pressure, whatever, the doctor will probably want to order a, a what they call a cardiac clearance, meaning that they want you to be cleared by your cardiologist or, or just an EKG in general so they can tell if your heart is actually fit for, for, um, for surgery because your body will go uh, through a lot of trauma, okay? And by having uh, by having an EKG, at least it gives them a baseline in case something does go wrong where they know where you stand uh, cardiac wise. So in the hospital, we use it in acute care. Acute care means uh, urgent care. If you go to the emergency room, let's say you are in a traumatic accident and the ambulance pulls you in, uh, be for sure you're gonna have an EKG regardless of your age, okay? Uh, they're going to be doing that. Uh, when we have a codes, like you've probably seen in some of the series, like uh, Grey's Anatomy, you see, uh, uh, oh, I think they always have codes, right, for some reason. Uh, uh, they call a code, and um, the electrocardiographer will come in and perform a 12-lead EKG. A 12-lead EKG is, a, a, is 12 views of your heart, okay? So if this is your heart, okay? You're looking at the heart, okay? You're looking at the front part, right? Well, the EKG will show you different views from looking at it this way, you're gonna look at the heart this way, you're gonna look at the heart this way and so on. So the electrocardiogram will give you 12 views of this, including the backside of the heart, okay? Because we do have arteries in the backside, okay? So that is when electrocardiogram is, and we're gonna go into detail, right? Uh, I, on the views and how they're produced and all that kind of stuff. And you're gonna be able to, to visualize, hopefully, the uh, electrocardiogram and understand it. So when we have a code blue, right? When uh, somebody has a uh, cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest, uh, we call a code. Some places call it Dr. 1000 or some other name, but uh, you will be able to respond. Uh, the electrocardiographer will have to perform that 12 EKG to see uh, what the heart is doing at that particular moment. Again, it's going to be a snapshot. Uh, if you're going to, um, uh, if, you the, if you are the electrocardiographer and the doctor ordered a STAT EKG, STAT means right now, and uh, the, uh, you, wa you, know, you walk into the person's room and, and you're going to tell them uh, you know, that your doctor ordered, the doctor, their doctor, ordered a, an EKG, a stat EKG. And you're like, what, what does that mean? What's wrong with me? You know, they're going to be starting to ask questions and wonder, how do you tell them, you know, without panicking, without sounding panicking, without worrying them more than they already are? You know, how do you tell them that you need to perform an EKG? Okay. Uh, usually for the most part, um, you try to explain it in a simple manner as calmly as you can without projecting any sense of urgency. 
uh, if they, you know, if they have questions that are not in your scope of practice, you're not allowed to answer, then you don't, okay? You, you can simply tell them, you know, uh, your doctor needs uh, an EKG to, to be able to give you, you know, treatment. Uh, what treatment? Well, you need to talk to your doctor about that. And of course, they're going to be worried and they're going to ask questions, but those questions are not for you to answer. You can just, you know, kind of hand them over to the nurse or to the doctor. They can uh, explain Okay, now many times it could be, like I said earlier, for, uh, for surgery, all right, for surgery. Uh, it could be maybe if the patient has complained of chest pain or has maybe just some kind of chest pain in general, uh, an EKG is always warranted, okay, always. Just to be on the safe side, doctors will always order an EKG, 12-lead uh, EKG, that is, okay. Uh, in the hospitals, uh, we also do different kinds of monitoring. Uh, we have the telemetry unit. The telemetry units are for those people that have cardiac, uh, chronic cardiac problems like uh, atrial fibrillation or they have heart disease, they've had heart attacks in the past, and they're very high risk of, you know, uh, their conditions getting worse. Uh, they'll usually stick them into a, a telemetry unit, so they'll sign them, plus they get paid more money to do that. So electrical um, uh, telemonitoring is very common uh, in the hospitals, and usually those units um, are very uh, a very good experience, okay? You ever get to work in a telemetry unit, uh, you can work there. You can be a telemetry um, monitor, meaning that, that you can um, be stuck in a room. I don't say it sounds bad, but you can be placed in a room, uh, you know, looking at monitors pretty much all day uh, for 12 hours, usually 12 hours a day. Uh, you'll be looking at monitors, you know, you'll be assigned maybe a group of patients, maybe 10 patients for you. So you'll be looking at their EKGs pretty much all day, among other things. You're not just going to be sitting there looking, staring at the monitors continuously. Uh, you, you know, you're given other chores. You have to make sure that the devices are working properly for the patients. Uh, you have to be make sure that um, that uh, you print out the records. You know, every eight hours or so, you have to print out a, an EKG, put in put in the machine, and so on. So there's other things that you have to do, but but. Uh, ECG mon or monitor technicians, I think that's what they call them, is another position. Uh, I just had a student that enrolled for my CNA class and she was hired as a, as a patient care technician in one of the hospitals. And uh, she has to do a lot of things like monitor the EKGs on patients. And uh, she's saying that she already knows how to do that. So that's good for her. Anyhow, uh, in doctor's offices, uh, EKGs are done routinely for again, for people usually over 40 years old or people that were born with some kind of heart condition. If they were born with a, you know, a, a, a bad heart and the doctors probably keep good track of the, of the heart cardiac function on that person. So they'll do EKGs routinely through every three months, every six months and so on and as needed. Uh, ambulatory care clinics, if you do have a procedure done, uh, you know, uh, out there and the um, in the public, you go in for a scheduled procedure and you're 40 years or older, uh, you're probably gonna require, be required a, a, an EKG, just again, to have it as a baseline. So what does the, what does the EKG tell us? What does it tell us at all? Okay, so again, it's gonna tell you mainly for the most part, the heart rhythm, okay? And the conduction system of the heart. That's what an EKG does. It tells us the conduction system of the heart, and we're going to look at that in the next chapter. Uh, it tells you if the, it can tell you if there's an electrolyte imbalance, like I said earlier. If you're not eating enough or not eating correctly, maybe you're fasting, maybe you're dieting, and you're lacking a lot of these electrolytes, you can actually affect the function of the heart. And an EKG can can tell you that because the EKG waves will be different, and they're very specific to different electrolyte imbalances, especially potassium. Conditions of the heart uh, prior to defibrillation. If somebody is uh, in a code and uh, they had cardiac arrest, and right before the person is defibrillated, you know the shocks, the paddles. Before we shock them, we can uh, look at the uh, the rhythm, okay, to see if it's a shockable rhythm. Okay, not not every rhythm that you see like on television is a, a shockable rhythm. Okay, if you see a flat line, you know that is not shockable rhythm. Okay, you cannot do anything with that. It is zero electricity flowing through the heart, okay? The heart needs some kind of electricity to be able to function. Uh, if there's any damage, if your heart, if you had a heart attack in the past, it can be detected in the AKG, okay? If there's any um, uh, ongoing heart attacks, like if somebody's having a heart attack right now, an EKG can actually tell you 
where exactly the heart attack is likely happening, which arteries are getting occluded and so on. So AKGs can, can be very specific. Uh, any symptoms related to, to, uh, to card, uh, your cardiovascular function? Uh, a lot of people feel fatigued sometimes, you know, we have very little energy, feel tired all the time. And that can be many, many reasons, but sometimes your heart just needs a little bit of exertion. You know, if you don't have a lot of physical activity in your life, your heart is becomes very, very uh, lazy. You can call it lazy. Okay. Um, and uh, by exerting it, by making it work, you can, you can actually, you feel a lot more energy, you know, after your exercise, uh, chest pain, shortness of breath, those are also uh, re require an EKG uh, automatically. Drug toxicity, some pa patients take medications that can affect the cardiac function. So an EKG can also tell you if you have too much of certain medications. Uh, any heart conditions prior to surgery, um, of course, can be detected. Mm, congenital heart disease, pacemaker functions. There's some patients that have pacemakers. And uh, you can tell right there, and we'll, there's a verse, uh, um, a whole chapter dedicated to pacemakers and how to detect pacemakers. There's ambulatory monitoring also. You might know someone that has had a, a um, pacemaker placed in, you know, in, their, in their body. Okay, it's a little device that, uh, they go, that has two wires or sometimes three wires connected to the heart and it stimulates the heart and so on. So we'll talk about pacemakers in, uh, I think it's chapter 11. Uh, about pacemakers, but um, ambulatory monitoring uh, is also part of uh, EKG for people that have had maybe symptoms like dizziness, fainting for no reason, or shortness of breath, or those, you know, uh, little chest pains here and there, okay? If you, uh, if people suffer uh, from those problems, then they can benefit from uh, what they call ambulatory monitoring. They, they put the, uh, the holter monitor, people call it a holter monitor, uh, but a monitor with a you know a few wires in there and they attach it and they have it on them for 24 hours you know sometimes even a month uh, they can have these devices and and they can track all the electrical activity going in the heart okay and they have to keep a diary and all that and again there's a chapter in ambulatory monitoring as well defibrillators are machines that um, correct okay correct uh, irregular rhythms okay if there is no rhythm, then there's nothing to correct, all right? So one of the differences, and it was a little bit of trick, not tricky, but confusing in the chapter, is the definitions uh, of a defibrillator and an AED, automatic external defibrillator. The uh, The main difference is that one is portable, and well, I guess they're both portable, but anyways, the AED is what you and I can use uh, out there in the public, okay? it's a, It stands for automatic external defibrillator, and anybody can use it. Okay, and we covered this also in CPR class, right? The uh, AED, once someone brings it in, you apply the pads, there's only two big pads, right? One you go here and one on the left flank. You put them on there and you stop CPR and you let the machine do its, right? You turn it on first, you turn it on, and then you follow the prompts. That's all you do. Whatever it tells you to do, right? It's gonna tell you to turn it on, it's gonna tell you to put the pads on and then wait, and, and then it's gonna give you a reading. That is an automatic external, but those devices are awesome. Uh, they have helped to save so many lives because they they can correct abnormal rhythms. When somebody has a cardiac arrest, okay, and you know that somebody you think you, you saw the signs of a cardiac arrest and you go render aid and you ask for the AED as part of the, uh, the chain of survival, you ask for the AED, someone brings it in and you apply it on them and there is a little bit of electrical activity still going on there, the machine can actually save that person's life. Okay, by correcting uh, an abnormal rhythm and uh, and bringing them back to the normal rhythm. So that's what a defibrillator does. It uh, it produces about 160 joules of electricity through the body. So it's very important that you're not touching the person or anything that the person has contact with. If they're in a bed and they're touching the bed rail uh, with one hand and you're on the other side and you're making contact with that bed, uh, you can get electrocuted. So it's very important that you remember to to um, move away, you know, uh, say, you know, everybody step back when you're going to um, uh, deliver a shock. So the ADs tell you when uh, a shock is indicated. If there is no shock indicated, it's going to tell you to resume CPR. Now, the defibrillators, on the other hand, these the ones that we have in the, uh, in the units, in the hospitals, and, and in the emergency room, 
those depend on your skills to be able to read the EKG. If you have no idea what you're looking at, then you can't shock anybody just because, you know, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Uh, the defibrillators can actually tell us uh, an EKG rhythm and uh, it, it can tell us, you know, if we can give medications um, to stimulate the heart, to make it more sensitive to electricity so it can start working again. If it starts working just a little bit, we can actually start, you know, um, perhaps, uh, you know, giving some shocks. So it just depends on what kind of rhythm we're looking at. But that is the main reason, okay? That is the main difference, right? Defibrillators can show you an EKG rhythm, <clears throat> but it will not do it for you. You have to know when to give it. And AEDs, it tells you everything and it does everything for you, okay? So that is the main difference. Uh, telemedicine is another um, use of EKGs. Again, uh, some people that have pacemakers or have heart disease, uh, they uh, sometimes are monitored by the cardiologist on a regular basis, and they can transmit all their EKG information via telephone, okay? Now, now it's cell phones, okay? Before we had wired phones. Now they can transmit it to, um, to their cell phone. So that's another use, and uh, it is used, you know, not too much, but again, for those patients that require constant monitoring of their heart, okay? Now, what are you going to do with AKG knowledge? What do you expect to learn, uh, or where are you going to work? Well, if you do decide to move on, you know, to further your education in EKG, which is a fascinating um, uh, profession, you can work as an electrocardiographer, or before that, you can be an EKG technician, okay? That means you can work in the, in the telemetry units. Uh, you can um, uh, be, uh, be an electrocardiographer. Now, these people, uh, electrocardiographers um, or cardiovascular technicians, rather, these people work uh, especially in the cardiac units, and they get paid very, very well, okay? Um, a lot of these uh, cardiovascular technicians work in the uh, what they call the um, cath lab, the catheterization lab or cardiac cath lab. Uh, let's say somebody's having a heart attack and they rush them to the hospital and automatically these people are going into the cath lab, meaning you're going to have a, a, an x-ray of the heart, okay? The cardiologist will actually inject a, a medication into the veins, all right, or into the arteries and it, it, it kind of uh, uh, shows the arteries and if they're clogged or not, if there is something clogged and it shows an x-ray at the same time. So cardiovascular um, uh, technicians can actually assist the physician having these uh, doing these procedures. Uh, and believe me guys, they get paid very well. Uh, there is some, you know, um, cons is that you have to be available, you have to be on call whenever, you know, there's a, uh, a situation that you have to go and and it, it comes with the perks, but it also have a lot of, it's also very demanding. Okay, you have to be on call uh, very often. All right, so an AED is used to treat what condition? What is an AED used to treat? Can someone tell me what is an AED used to treat? What do you use it for? Anyone, tell me. To correct the heart's electrical pattern. Okay, yes, but when do we use it? When the person, there you go. Thank you. To, to correct uh, or to help with cardiac arrest. Okay, that's usually the, the time when we're gonna be using it. Uh, and it does correct the, the irregular rhythm if there's any rhythms, okay? Uh, so what is the role of an EKG technician? An EKG technician, what are they gonna be doing? Um, it depends what setting you are, okay? Mostly in hospitals, they view and evaluate EKGs. So you see it and you evaluate it. And if there's any problems, obviously you're going to report it. Now, if you're in a hospital, you're um, a monitor technician, then you report it to the primary nurse in that case. Usually, uh, let's say if I'm the nurse and you're the monitor tech and you see something that's funny that's going on in the EKG and you tell me, you know, that is pretty much up to there that your responsibility. After that, then it's me, okay? So again, you, uh, you see it, uh, evaluate it and report it to the nurse and then they're responsible to do it, okay? That is part of your job. 
uh, of course, you're responsible to also um, handle the, the the devices, right? The telemetry, uh, the uh, packs, right? The devices and, and the EKG electrodes, make sure they're in place. If they're uh, messing up, then you're responsible to go fix it and correct it and so on. So that's part of your job, print out an EKG, usually a, a six second um, strip for the physician to evaluate. And you have to make sure that you print a quality EKG, okay? Uh, an EKG that, that the doctor can actually read. If you, pr if you print out something that's all full of artifact, okay, you'll know later what that means. And it's all scribbly and it's dark and it's a mess. Uh, someone's not gonna be very happy, okay? And uh, the doctors you know, will call you out on that. Uh, so anyways, those are part of your, that is part of your role. Okay, now when you're going to prepare uh, to, uh, for an EKG, let's say you work in a clinic and you're gonna perform an EKG on someone, uh, you have to uh, have some, obviously, uh, or take care of some things before you actually perform it. Number one is that you have to get consent. Uh, you cannot perform an EKG without somebody's consent, either a written consent that they sign a paper or a verbal consent or some kind of uh, agreement where they've already agreed to perform the, to have the procedure done on them, all right? Uh, you have to make sure that you follow the rules, okay? The, all the laws, the, uh, be ethical, be an ethical person, meaning do the right thing. Do not um, do, not do anything uh, that you shouldn't be doing uh, and protect the, the patient's privacy. HIPAA is a law that was passed back in 1986. And uh, we talk about HIPAA a lot in healthcare. It stands for Health uh, Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Uh, what it is, is um, it's a law that keeps people from uh, talking about other people's information. If you're in the hospital and you're going to have a procedure done, uh, you wouldn't want everybody to be talking about you, right, in public to other people, right, divulging your personal information. You would feel violated, uh, and that's exactly what HIPAA does. It keeps us from, from talking about people, right, in the public or spreading information or sharing information with anyone. Uh, let's say uh, you guys work in the hospital and uh, one of you is an EKG technician and you saw that somebody, you know, maybe is famous in the community, goes in there for an EKG. You should not be talking about that to anyone, okay? Uh, even if it's someone um, related to the person, okay? If someone is related to the person is going to ask you, hey, what's going on with my uncle? You know, I saw he came in here and having an EKG done and uh, you should not be sharing any information at all with that person. You only share information with people that are directly involved in the care of this person. Okay. Other than that, you have, they have no business knowing. Even other doctors, if they're not involved in the care of that person, then they have no, no, uh, um, right to, to know anything about that person, okay? All right, so make sure it is our job to protect their information. Uh, many professions have a code of ethics, okay? Meaning standards of behavior, okay? Uh, we, we, everybody works, you know, uh, in an ethical manner. You should anyways. Uh, practice ethics, uh, confidentiality is uh, one of the main reasons, okay? One of the main things that we have, confidence. So we didn't talk about patients outside of work. Once we leave work, that's it. We're gonna talk about them. Uh, you are responsible for whatever you do or for whatever you don't do as a healthcare professional, okay? If you forget to do something, uh, saying, I'm sorry, I forgot, that doesn't, it's not gonna you know, relieve you of your responsibility. You're still accountable for whatever actions you do or you don't do. Uh, you don't talk about people uh, uh, badly in any way, shape or form. Uh, sometimes, uh, Patients will ask you, you know, is this a good doctor or can you refer me a good doctor and so on. Uh, you want to stay away from answering those kinds of questions uh, because um, uh, if you're, you know, say something like, oh, my God, that doctor is horrible. All his patients die. You know, that's that's called slander. OK, that's called slander. And you, you may ruin somebody's uh, reputation and you can be held responsible for that. If you write something, you know, uh, liable. Uh, like if you write an article in the newspaper or anywhere and talking bad about someone that's also against the law, okay? And they can actually um, sue you for things like that, for slander or libel. So make sure you don't talk about it. Documentation is very important. We we have to document everything that we do. 
uh, all the time, as soon as we do things. I know sometimes it's easy to say, well, you know, I'll do it later and I do it, in, you know, when I'm done doing this or that. And the next thing you know, something happens. Uh, so uh, documenting, reporting things is another important part of your job. We have to document things and report them. Communication is very, very important with everybody. You communicate mainly with your team members, okay? If you're a monitor technician, you're in the hospital in the telemetry unit, obviously you communicate with, uh, with, your, with your nurses, um, with the, the CNAs, the nurse assistants, and of course the doctor, okay? You have to make sure that you keep that line of communication open all the time and ask questions many times. Um, uh, we forget, uh, someone's asking, how about the, the spouse, okay? Well, the spouse can mean several things, okay? If the, the wife is there, okay, uh, if you're in the room and um, the patient, uh, first you have to make sure that it is the spouse, okay? It could be a significant other, uh, it could be a family member, but if you're in the room and, uh, and the person, uh, you know, wants to know information about your patient, uh, you need to ask the patient first, okay? Is it okay if, uh, you know, we give information to them? Or sometimes you can just, Tell them, why don't you ask them? They can tell you, right? If they're there in the room, just, you know, if I'm the visitor and I ask you, oh, how was the EKG done? Okay, well, number one, uh, you're not allowed to give any interpretations of the EKG because that is not in your scope of practice. I can just tell them, you need to talk to the doctor about that as far as the results. If they wanna know any other information, uh, why are they here or in the hospital and so on, then you need to uh, tell the patient, well, you know, he knows, okay? The patient knows why they're here. Uh, you can ask them, okay? Or refer them to, to the nurse, have them answer those questions for you. So you can always kind of find a way to, you know, give that responsibility to somebody else, especially because sometimes as a monitor technician or electric, electrocardiographer, you may not know all that information, okay? Again, we all get information on a need to know basis, okay? Uh, as a nurse, we, we have pretty much access to most information, including laboratory, labs. We have um, their medical history, everything about them we know. What we probably don't know is about their billing and coding and all that kind of stuff. That doesn't pertain to us, so we don't know anything about that. But uh, everybody gets information on a need-to-know basis. Um, go document things as soon as, um, as, you, get, uh, you, know, as, uh, as you do them, okay? Not before, not before you perform things. That would be illegal. That's called fraud. Again, consent uh, has to be obtained before the procedure, either uh, verbally or written. If somebody um, does not understand English, you have somebody has, they have the right to get an interpreter. Uh, and usually we need a witness to, to sign for them. Someone that understands if the person does, uh, is unable to read, they need a witness and then they have to make an X and some the witness has to sign with them and so on. So you may not be responsible for the consent itself. Someone else might be doing that, but in case you are responsible, you need to make sure that yeah, you follow the policies of the facility. You know, what are the policies? If a person doesn't understand, if they don't know, of course they would probably need a caregiver to accompany them and so on. So make sure you understand uh, what entails to, um, uh, what you need to do before you actually perform the procedure, okay? All right, I'm going to give you guys a little 10-minute break, okay? It's 9.08. Uh, take a little 10-minute break, and we'll be right back. Please have uh, more questions for, for me, guys. Uh, you guys are too quiet. It's kind of one-way communication, so I'll be back in 10 minutes, okay? So uh, don't go away. So... If you instruct the patient okay, uh, uh, during uh, what the procedure is and, and all that, you're gonna take, you know, you're gonna answer a lot of the questions. So you save yourself a lot of time. Uh, so again, safety is, is very important. Make sure you use good body mechanics. If you are unable to help someone onto the stretcher, maybe the person is uh, unable to stand and transfer and you know, it becomes very difficult. Uh, that requires a different kind of EKG, but we'll talk about those later. So safety is very important. Infection control, uh, I talked about it earlier, right? Uh, when you were asking about why you got the questions wrong uh, on, the, on the matching. Uh, so infection control, right? I say standard precautions is the measure that you take with every person, right? To reduce the risk of getting, making contact with body fluids. Body fluids such as saliva, urine, feces, and so on. 
So those are standard, okay? You apply them to every single person, all right? Standard, that's what it means. And then the other ones that we talked about, isolation precautions, those are the ones that we, they're specific to certain people that have um, infections that are contagious. For right now, we have uh, COVID, right? We know that COVID, supposedly it's transmitted through droplet, like saliva. So we have to stay a distance, right? We have to wear a mask in some, at work. Uh, we even have to wear a shield, okay? A shield to prevent uh, us from, you know, uh, spreading more droplets, saliva onto surfaces, onto other people. Because when we talk and speak and laugh and, and scream, not to mention sneeze and cough, things just, you know, project outwards and you can spread it to a lot of people. So taking isolation precautions is an addition addition to your standard precautions because a person uh, might have something that you might contract or you might have something without knowing that you might pass on to somebody else. As you know, it's very, very easily to contract uh, the COVID uh, virus uh, and other viruses as well. Okay, you just never know when someone is infected or when you're infected and you can make other people sick. So we have to wear our personal protective equipment, right? PPE, you wear, uh, you're gonna learn how to wear that. Um, we do that in CNA class. Uh, because we nursing assistants do a lot with the residents or patients uh, very often all the time. And many times these patients have conditions that require isolation and you have to learn how to put on correctly your PPE and how to take it cough correctly your PPE. That's part of the, the training skills that we have, especially right now, very, very important. So hand hygiene is something else that we practice a lot right now. We're supposed to be practicing uh, either washing your hands, okay? So here, when uh, we do CNA class, we, we, um, we learn how to wash our hands uh, according to the state guidelines, okay? You're supposed to wet your hands, you know, and then lather, make a lather, you know, for 20 seconds and all that. You guys heard of all that stuff. Now, it's not just like anybody else does it, but we, we practice here the way the state wants us to do it. So it's important that you learn that hand hygiene, not just uh, washing your hands with running water, but also using the the sanitizers, okay? Those sanitizers are used also almost as often as hand washing. And you're supposed to use a lot of sanitizer. I know a lot of people just, you know, go grab, you know, uh, some dispensers, give you a foam. And that foam doesn't seem to be a lot, okay? You need to use like a lot of foam, okay? So use enough gel as if you were actually gonna wash your hands. You know, it might be a little bit, you know, more two, three squirts and use it and scrub and wash your hands just like you were washing your hands with water, you know, scrub, scrub, scrub until the gel is completely dry. That is how you're supposed to use sanitizers, not just one little square and yeah, that, that's not enough. Okay, so make sure you follow all the, um, the isolation precautions. When you walk up to a patient's room and you see a yellow sign on the door, you see a yellow sign, you'll know that that person is in isolation precautions. Now, there's three main ones that we talk about. First are airborne. Airborne are uh, conditions that, um, or diseases that can be spread through the air. Okay, there's like, uh, for example, tuberculosis, uh, the measles. The, the, these particles are so small that they can get suspended in the air and they're floating around, right? Somebody has it, doesn't know it, talking, speaking, you know, that, that uh, virus or bacteria is floating around in the air. And then people come in, and there's air drafts, you know, take it back and forth. Next thing you know it, everybody's got, you know, uh, tuberculosis. So it's very important that you know what equipment you need to wear. So airborne is one of them, okay? And for that, you need to wear uh, not just a, a regular mask, but a uh, N95. N95 mask is a special mask that has a filter in it. And it's uh, it filters out very, very small particles. So I, I have a question right now. Well, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you right now when I'm done. Uh, so the airborne, and you have your droplet, okay, which um, you don't require N95, okay? Droplet, again, bacteria that travel through saliva, like talking, speaking, sneezing, coughing, okay? And then you have your contact precautions, those that are uh, require direct contact with a person. Let's say they have a wound and they have an infection in the wound or they have diarrhea, right? Very bad diarrhea, and you're coming in contact with that person. You're going to have to wear, obviously, your gown, and gloves. You don't need to wear a mask or a shield. No. If there are contact precautions, just gloves and a mask so that your uniform is not come in contact with that person or any part of their, their environment, okay? So I have a question for you guys, okay? Is COVID-19 a droplet or is it an airborne disease? How does it spread? Droplet. 
droplet, okay? Is that you, uh, Janie? Droplet, synthesis droplet, okay? So yes, that's that what, me. huh? Yeah, that's what they're telling us, right? That is droplet. The CDC and everybody else is telling us it's a droplet precaution. So what equipment do we use? Uh, well, let, let me tell you, in healthcare, uh, if you look at the, the, um, the people that are working in the hospitals, what kind of mask are they wearing? Is it a, is it a, um, a regular mask or the is N95. it an N95, right? But N95s are indicated for what kind of infections? Airborne. Exactly. So is COVID airborne or is it droplet? Droplet. That's what they're telling us. So the CDC guys, sometimes because COVID-19 is, um, I said, it's, it's a brand new virus. This is, they never dealt with it. And now they're saying that there's even, so is it both? It's gotta be one or the other. I'm leaning more towards airborne, okay? If they're taking these extraordinary precautions, okay? And it is very contagious, then I would say probably it's more like an airborne, okay? Uh, if you remember from the very beginning, first they said it was this and it was that, they were going back and forth. And as of right now, I think it's a, a, a way to keep people from panicking, okay? Uh, they, they tell you a little bit at a time, right? They don't tell you everything all at once so that people don't panic and run, run out and, you know, or, or do strange things. But uh, I think I'm leaning more towards an airborne because I know I've heard at times that they said, well, it can be stay in the air for longer periods of time or droplets don't stay in the air. They just go, right? You sneeze, it goes a little bit further, right? Cough, further. But if, if I'm talking right here, uh, bacteria or droplets that I'm spitting out uh, should go at about three feet at the most, okay? Three feet, 36 inches, 30 feet. Okay, they tell us, first they remember they told us to stay three feet apart and then they said, what, six feet apart? And next thing you know, it's gonna be stay home. Well, actually that is what they're saying, right? Uh, anyhow, so you have to understand, that explains why lots of people that don't go out, get it? Yeah. Uh, I've been fortunate, I've not contracted the virus. Many, many people have. But if you keep your circle, guys, like if you stick around with the people in that live in your house or your family that does not go out, okay, does not go out. We have family members that go out all the time. They go out the here and there, and then they meet other people that go out in there. And next thing you know, they get the, the I've heard a lot of um, my coworkers, they're, they're testing positive. I get tested twice a week. I get tested twice a week, okay, the, the nose one. Um, and uh, fortunately, I've been negative all this time, but there's some uh, coworkers that have been testing positive, not them, not, they didn't get it. Their, their, uh, their family members brought it into them, okay? So, you know, it, it, it comes down to that, you know, to the circle of people that you're around, okay? Now, uh, do you go out? Yeah, I go out sometimes to a restaurant, okay? Uh, you know, these people are following you know, the, the distancing, which is great, okay? They wouldn't put up those plastic shields around, which is great too. But uh, yeah, if you, if you have people coming over uh, and they're from out of town, if they're from a bigger town like Austin, San Antonio, uh, you're gonna have to be very careful, okay? Uh, the, the bigger cities obviously have more dense populations, meaning they live like, like closer to each other. Uh, and so there's a higher risk of get contracting. So uh, some of these people that have been testing positive uh, or not, they haven't tested positive. What, what they're saying is that a family member that came from San Antonio tested positive and they came to their house. So now these people can't show up to work. They've been uh, quarantined for 14 days. So we're short staffed all the time because people are, uh, people's family members are testing positive. Okay, um, anyhow, uh, moving on. So I uh, hope everybody everybody gets it, right? Um, the different kinds of precautions that you need to take. First is standard with everybody all the time. And then you take your isolation precautions based on whatever they have, okay? So yeah, staying home helps a lot, okay? For the most part, I'm usually always home um, for right now. Uh, but uh, sometimes we have to get out. 
everybody, you, you got to get out there, you know, at least breathe some fresh air. Okay, next section is very interesting. I think uh, Janie um, and Norma, you should have pretty good knowledge on the vital signs. Vital signs are a very important part of uh, our work. To me, they're the most essential information that I need, okay, to be, even before I see a patient physically, just by looking at the vital signs, I can tell more or less how their bodies are doing, okay, especially their heart. Uh, vital signs are measured uh, every single day um, and they're part of the medical record. Uh, we measure the pulse, respirations, uh, blood pressure, and temperature right now, and sometimes even the oxygen saturation. Uh, I think we talked about it in CNA class. Um, oxygen saturation is, um, is part of the, your vital signs in some places, not every place. Uh, but then pain. Pain is also a very important vital sign. I don't think this book talks about pain. Maybe it does. Mm. <clears throat> but it's, we call it the fifth vital sign, okay? The fifth vital sign because it affects everything. If you're in pain, it affects your heart rate, it affects your temperature, your blood pressure, right? You're even your breathing. So it affects everything, even in your mind. So you're going to have to learn how to perform vital signs, okay? At least know what they are, what they mean. There's parameters for vital signs. Um, those are in CNA, but I think they're also here on page uh, 19 in this book. So your pulse is usually between 60 to 100 beats per minute. Or your breathing, if you're awake, should be between 12 to 20, or actually usually 18 to 20. Um, but uh, yeah, and no less than 12, uh, and no more than, I would say, 22 respirations per minute, okay? And then your blood pressure. Your blood pressure has two... two um, two readings, we have your systolic and your diastolic. And those are gonna be very important because it's gonna tell you a lot about the patient's heart, okay? So pulse and respiration. Pulse and respiration are related because the circulatory system and the breathing. The heart and the lungs are like this, okay? They're like brother and sister, okay? Or brother and brother, sister and sister, no. I don't think brother and sister get along better than sister and sister, I don't know. Um, anyways. You have to learn what they, what they are and what it means and how it affects the, the, uh, the entire body, especially your heart, your pulse. You're going to learn how to measure pulse right here, right? And the thumb side. What do you call this uh, pulse? Janie, do you remember what you call this pulse? It's called the what? The radio pulse. Okay. Your radio pulse is right here using two fingers on your thumb side. You can feel your pulse, right? It's palpating. That's your heartbeat. And you set the parameters between 60 to 100. So if you measure, okay, I want you to measure right now, measure your pulse and type in, give me your, your pulse right now. See what it, how fast it's going. Count it for about, uh, about 30 seconds. Okay. And uh, type it in here. Tell me what your pulse is doing. All right. So your pulse is, uh, is your heartbeat. Okay. And we measured per minute. Uh, it's an indirect measurement, also what we call cardiac output. Cardiac output, guys, I want you to know this word because we're going to be using it a lot. Cardiac output, okay? The amount of blood the heart pumps per minute. How do you know how much blood your, your heart is pumping right now? Hmm? I'm going to give you a little math test right now. So you're going to figure out how much your, uh, your, uh, your heart, how much blood your heart is pumping per minute. Okay. All right. So an average, on average, adults have about five gallons of blood going in your body. Okay. It's flowing everywhere. Okay. Your heart is pumping everything. It's going, right? 32. Janie, that's not right. Oh, 32 times two. Okay, you multiply times two, that means you're at 64 beats per minute. I said 30 seconds, so you multiply times two, right, for one minute. So your heart is beating 64 beats per minute. That's pretty cool. That's pretty chill. Are you very relaxed, laying down, listening to me? Oh, okay, that explains that. So your cardiac output, okay, we're going we're gonna to figure out, right, uh, how much, right? Um, if you multiply... Um, I'll give you the formula, cardiac output. I uh, forgot the formula over here. I'll give it to you in just a minute. I'll give the formula in just a minute. All right, so we're going to determine how much cardiac, uh, how much blood your heart is pumping per, per, uh, per stroke, 
okay every time it contracts okay okay stroke volume okay on average on an adult stroke volume is another word uh, i'm not sure it's on this chapter but stroke volume means how much blood your 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 heart pumps every contraction on average is about 70 milliliters 70 mls per stroke per heartbeat okay so 70 mls per uh stroke okay times uh heart rate equals cardiac output so your heart rate uh let's see multiply it times uh 70. Seventy-six times your, uh, or yeah, your heart rate. Seventy times your heart rate. That equals how many mLs? Okay. Type in your answer. It's not shouldn't be plus. Should be equals. Okay. Seventy times your heart rate equals. Oops. Equals. Quite a couple. There. That's the way it should be. All right. So. The rhythm, um, your pulse, when you feel your pulse, it should feel nice and strong, right? You can feel it pretty good. Now, some people have very faint pulses, like really slow, boom, boom, boom. If you're athletic, if you exercise a lot, you go to the gym or you just do a lot of exercise, okay? You're physically active. Your pulse can be very calm. Like you can barely feel it, okay? Your blood pressure will even be low. Does that mean something is wrong with you? No, it just means that your heart has very good physical condition okay that myocardium okay the the main muscle of the heart this one oops sorry backwards this one right here the myocardium okay is very strong okay and it pumps a lot of blood with one contraction some people have a weak heart so it pumps but it doesn't pump a lot of blood with contraction so they need to pump the heart will pump faster so that's why you have a heart faster heart rate, okay? If your heart rate, if you're resting, you're sitting down, uh, you're just there on your computer and your heart rate is about 80 or higher, that means you need more physical exercise, okay? Resting, your heart rate should be between 60 and 70, I would say. If you're athletic, you're probably in the 50s, okay? So did anybody do the math there? 70 times your heart rate equals cardiac output. Okay, so when you're measuring your pulse, make sure you do not use your thumb, okay? Your thumb has a pulse too. So make sure that you use your two fingers, okay? Now respiration, your breathing, we have two sections. Yes, now 5,320 5, watts, milliliters, milliliters, okay? Milliliters, okay, 5,320 divided by 1,000 equals equals uh, 5.3 liters. Oops. So your heart is pumping, uh, Janie, uh, who put 5320? Oh, yeah, Cynthia, sorry, Cynthia. Your heart is pumping 5.3 liters per minute. It's a lot of blood, right? 5.3 liters per minute. It's a lot of blood. So your heart is nonstop, literally, okay, nonstop. So when you were breathing, okay, sounds scary. <laughs> it's not scary, actually, it's pretty cool, pretty neat. The heart muscle is made up of very special tissue, okay? Tissue is made of cells, okay? And when we talk about cells, when, when we're here in person, I'll explain to you the um, what we call the sodium potassium pump and what makes those cells make that tissue contract, contract, contract without non nonstop, okay? Now, without going into too much detail, the, the heart, uh, in the, when we talk about the, um, the electrical conduction tissue, which is a different tissue than the muscle, okay? Uh, the heart is, 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 it's a miracle. It starts by itself. 
it starts by itself. There's nothing that that makes it go. It starts all by itself. Okay, and that's why sometimes we're doctors, and you know, when they do a code, they're able to bring the heart back. They help it bring it back. It starts by itself. Okay, uh, and they are able to bring it back with compressions and medications and, and even electrical shock. All right, so uh, staying on the virus and so respiration, breathing is inhale, exhale. That's one. Two. All right, so you got to count two. Okay, in and out is one. You count for one full minute, and that'll be the number of respirations. And it should be between, oh, right, if you're awake, uh, between uh, 18 to 20, usually. Okay, 18 to 20 is the normal. If you're sleeping, next time you see somebody sleeping, count the respirations for one minute, and you're going to notice they're usually about 14 to 16. Okay, some people go even slower, which is to me, that's scary. So your blood pressure, another important measurement, very, very important, because this is directly related to the heart. What is blood pressure? I might have explained it to you all before. Blood pressure is the resistance against your heart, okay? When you open the faucet, okay, let's say you're going outside, you're going to water the lawn, right? You open the faucet, abre la llave, right? And out comes the flow. Here in the United States, guys, we have very good... Um, uh, water flow. Very good. Why? What keeps the water flowing? How, why does it flow? If you go to Mexico, guys, if you all haven't been to Mexico, okay, uh, I would say any part of Mexico, you open the faucet, you have a little stream, you know, you have the big hose, right? And you can see the little stream coming out. Why is it different? Anybody? Anybody have any idea? What keeps the water flowing, okay? What keeps the pressure in the water, okay? So if you, you guys live, you know, in Michigan and any city here in the United States, you're going to see those big towers, right? The ones that have your, your high school uh, logo, right? Your mascot, okay? And, uh, where are they here? I know in mile two, there's one, the Patriots. And then, uh, I don't know, there's several, right? Every city has a water tower. OK, those water towers, guys, depending on the size of the city, you have more than one. They keep they pump the water up. Right. They pump it up to that big tank, the big tank. Right. And then it comes down to gravity. Right. It gushes down. They have the big pipes. If you look at those pipes they are huge. Right. But it ha in the house, we have these little pipes. They're about one inch and they get even smaller. Right. So how is that? How is that? Um, similar to your body. How is that the same to your body? Well, it's very similar. Your aorta, which is a main uh, artery in your heart, okay? In this case, this little image, right? You have your aorta, this red one, okay? Comes out of your heart. This is, where is it? I keep losing my, pay. there it is. I should use my hand. This aorta, okay, is the main, the main, the largest artery in the heart, okay? It's big, and if you look at the branches, the red ones, they get smaller right away. You see, they get smaller. And as they run, they branch off away from the heart, they get smaller and smaller and smaller till we get to the capillary level where they're very small, okay? So you have your arteries, and then they get smaller. They, we call them arterioles, okay? And then they meet with the veins, with those blue ones, okay? They meet and they, we call them capillaries. This is where all the exchange happens, the nutrients, the gases, the hormones, and everything. It's like the marketplace. They go to the market and you make exchanges. This is the capillary level. So again, back to the example, the analogy, right? So these get large and they get smaller and smaller. Same thing in your house. If you open the faucet, water just gushes down. Why? Because there's pressure coming from bigger, bigger water pipes and smaller and smaller and smaller. So when you open your faucet, water just gushes out. Apparently, uh, in Mexico, they didn't design things this way, okay? So the water flow, if you have a big pipe and it stays big all the time, there's going to be very little pressure, all right? If there's if they're smaller, pipes are smaller, there's going to be a lot of pressure, okay? So blood pressure, guys, is a very important measurement that we do, 
Okay, you're gonna learn how to measure blood pressure. It's pretty easy. I think Janie and Norma, you should already know how to measure blood pressure. We have two numbers. We have your systolic pressure and then your diastolic pressure. Your systolic pressure is when your when your left ventricle, okay, contracts and it pushes the blood out. That is a measure that we, we call it the systolic pressure and we write it down. That's gonna be your first number or your top number. Some people put it on top, some in the bottom. Whatever, that is your first number that you hear. So when we start listening and we hear the first number, that is your systolic. And then we keep on listening. And the last clear sound that we have, we call it your diastolic pressure. That means when the ventricle or the ventricles, both of them, okay, are relaxing. Contract, systole, relax, diastole. Systole, diastole, okay? So we'll practice that later here, okay? So you can have a better understanding. I know sometimes the concept of uh, blood pressure is a little bit difficult to understand, uh, but I really like when people understand how the blood pressure works. Okay, Why do people have blood, high blood pressure? Well, there's many factors, and I'm not going to go into that right now, but one of them is obviously smoking, uh, stress, okay, uh, over obesity or overweight. Okay, uh, There's a lot of things that can uh, lead you to have develop high blood pressure, but we are concerned more with the reading. Is it high? Is it low? There's parameters for that, and we'll go into that later, right? Your systolic pressure usually should be between 90 millimeters of mercury to 120 millimeters of mercury. Anything above 120 is considered now pre-hypertension. Your diastolic measurement should be anywhere between 60 to 90 millimeters of mercury. Anything above 90, or 89 rather, is considered pre-hypertension. Now, what's the main difference? Which one's more important? Sometimes we people ask me, which one's more important? Well, the more important one is your systolic pressure. Okay. I have a I have a patient. She's a 101 years old. She just turned 101 on my birthday, December the 3rd. So she's concerned about her diastolic pressure. Okay, now she's 101. She wants to have good blood pressure, okay, at 101. Um, I tell her not to be too concerned about it because the diastolic pressure is not a big deal, okay? It's not a big deal, but we can go into that later, okay? Uh, so we're more concerned about your systolic, right? When your ventricles contract, that's the one we're more concerned for because we're concerned with cardiac output. What's cardiac output? The amount of blood that is pushed out every minute, okay? So we said... For um, Janie, you have 5.3 liters. What was that, Cynthia? Oh, that was Cynthia. All right. Um, whatever it is, your heart rate, you have to uh, more or less. And as you're going to... Oh, uh, let me give you an example. And I'll, I'll finish with this, guys. I have a resident, okay? His heart rate is usually between 36 to 42 beats per minute. 36 to 40 beats per minute. And now if you do the math, Okay, 36, or let's say 40, because easier, 40 times 70, that's 2,800. If you divide that by 1,000, you say 2.8 liters per minute. How come this person's um, cardiac output is so low? Now he's 80 some, I think he's 83 or something like that. Why is his heart not able to push out more blood? Well, because most older people, most of them have a condition called congestive heart failure. And we'll talk more about it um, in chapter 13 towards the end. They have congestive heart failure where their heart is just too weak. It does not compress. It does not push enough blood out. Okay. Now, that's completely different than somebody that's very athletic. Maybe one of those guys that does those triathlons, you know, they, they run and swim and bike and do everything in there. Uh, those guys is different you know their heart can push out a lot of blood in just you know one contraction probably more than us but anyhow hypertension is high blood pressure hyper is high tension is resistance and the opposite is hypo hypo is low tension is resistance so low blood pressure low resistance which one is is more dangerous or well, they're both just as bad okay high hypertension can cause you a stroke a heart attack Hypo, low blood pressure, can give you other problems, such as blood clots, which can travel to your brain and give you, um, give you a stroke or even a heart attack or a, uh, uh, 
uh, a pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot in your lungs, which is just as bad. So low blood pressure is not good because uh, you can get dizzy, faint, fall, and injure yourself. And there's a lot of other complications that can occur. But you're going to learn how to measure blood pressure here later on, uh, what we call auscultated blood pressure. You're going to be listening with the stethoscope right here on the brachial artery, okay? Using this, these, and then the cuff, you're gonna inflate it and all that. You're gonna practice that later on. So again, it's very important that you know how to measure the vital signs because they're very essential to our work, okay? We cannot function without vital signs. Just like an EKG is as important to the doctors, vital signs are just as important to, to us, to the doctors and to the nurses, okay? All right, which three vital signs are of particular importance to EKG technicians? You as an EKG technician, which ones are of particular importance? Which ones will you be more concerned with? Pulse, uh, respiration, and blood pressure. That's correct. Those are the main ones because those will affect your EKG um, uh, electrocardiogram. Okay, it's gonna it's gonna show that. Okay, the person is nervous. It's gonna show a heart rate real high, and it's gonna affect cardiac output. Uh, it's gonna show maybe even abnormal rhythms when somebody breathing. They're breathing too fast. It's gonna affect the the EKG rhythm as well. And you will learn about that later, okay? What is the difference between a palpated blood pressure and an auscultated blood pressure? I don't think I discussed palpated, I bet. Well, the difference is that when you palpate a, a blood pressure, okay, uh, you put the cuff on, okay, and you're gonna inflate it, let's say to 180, okay? With two fingers, you feel the pulse. And when you start, feel the first pulse coming back, that'll be your first number, and then is going to be an estimated, okay? The main difference is that a palpated is an estimated versus auscultated, which is the one you listen to, that's going to be an actual reading, okay? So when you don't have, a, I guess, the stethoscopes, you're going to have to do a palpated blood pressure, all right? Anyways, any questions, ladies? We went right through chapter one real quick, okay? Um, any questions? I didn't see any questions on the chat. Um, I didn't hear any questions from you guys. So I hope you've completed chapter one review on Friday. We'll continue with chapter two. Okay. It's the anatomy of the heart, which is very interesting. If you haven't already, there's a lot of terms, guys. Sorry. There's a lot of terms. I feel bad for you, but it's really important that you know the, the terms because uh, once you know the anatomy of the heart, Okay, you can understand a lot of the things, okay? But you have to know it, really important, okay? Uh, Ms. Cynthia, any questions or concerns? I know you had the questions about the quiz, but I think I answered them. Not right now, okay. I don't think I've met you. Hopefully we'll meet here soon. Uh, let me see, chapter two, and chapter three. Chapter three is the electrocardiograph. Perhaps we can meet next week, okay? On, um, uh, see, I wanna meet when we're already actually doing the, the, the cardio. I want you guys to come in just to, for a break. And uh, hopefully we can come in when, oh, wait a minute. There's other people. Maybe we can get volunteers so y'all can perform an EKG on them. Okay, uh, so chapter three is about, talks about the machine itself, about the features, the different things that you can do with it, different studies. Uh, chapter four is the actual doing the electrocardiogram. So before you do the, the ECG, well, you have to know how to operate the machine, okay? So we, we're gonna have to wait until chapter four, which may be next week around Wednesday, okay? By next Wednesday, we can actually uh, come in person, uh, come in person and, um, and we can practice the EKG on each other. Okay, very, very easy. All right. So, as any if, uh, plan for next Wednesday to be here. All right. At what time? From eight to 10 ish. Eight, like the same? Yeah. Okay. Eight to 10 ish. Okay. 10 ish, like maybe a little longer, maybe a little less. But we should be here at least at two hours since there's going to be four of you. Okay. Uh, you can, it takes a little while sometimes to practice to perform the EKG on more than one person. But um, anyhow, if there's no other questions, then uh, I'm done, guys. Please uh, email me any questions, and I'll be more than glad to, to answer them, okay? Or call me or text or something, okay? All right, I'll see you guys. Have a good one. Okay. Stay safe. All right, thank you. Thank you.